Oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, the Archaeological Society Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology are delighted to welcome you to this, our seventh, seventh uh, in the series of talks for 2020-2021. Um, uh, there are several participants from abroad. I'm delighted to see them. Uh, and uh, um, we have a good, good group today and the, the numbers keep keep coming in. Um, just for those who don't know me, I'm Patricia Camilleri, President of the Archaeological Society in Malta, and I shall be mediating, as usual, this evening's proceedings. Uh, I'd like to ask you to make sure that you mute yourselves so that we don't have any echo issues or noises off, as uh, sometimes happens with these video links. Um, I'd like to inform everybody that this is being recorded. Uh, the use of your own video, of course, is uh, totally optional. Uh, all of the season's lectures, uh, as uh, those of you who's joined us before know, is a collaboration between the Department of Classics and Archaeology, uh, the University of Malta, and uh, our society. Uh, thanks go to the head of department, Dr. John Seabet, who I think is with us this evening, if I saw rightly, on the participant list, and to Professor Nicholas Bella, of course, the ASM Vice President, who is really our link between the society and the department. Uh, just a word about how we shall proceed this evening. Uh, I'll be introducing our guest speaker, Rebecca Sherry, then turning the virtual floor over to her. Please uh, do ask questions. Uh, on, you can do that on the chat, even as Rebecca speaks. Um, you, can, you can do that and I'll be looking at them. And uh, that's accessible at the bottom or, or the top of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using. Um, and at the end, I shall ask Rebecca to answer perhaps some of those qu queries, uh, depending on how much time we have at our disposal. This evening's lecture is entitled uh, Historiography of Maltese Catacomb Study from the 16th century to 1899. So let's move on. A quick word, a very um, uh, a reductive bio, I think, of our guest speaker, in fact. Ms. Sherry is an archaeology honors graduate uh, with a keen interest in the catacombs, and she is currently writing a, a PhD, uh, reading for a PhD, on the topic of maritime archaeology and heritage studies at the University of Malta. So, without further ado, over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Patricia. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, and thank you to the Archaeological Society of Malta for having me this evening. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say a few thanks. Uh, firstly, to David Cardona for actually um, creating the link between me and ASM when they were looking for speakers for uh, talks actually last year when this was initially supposed to take place. Um, however, due to COVID, things got a bit jumbled up. However, I'm happy that we're here today and that I'm able to deliver this talk. And um, also before I begin, I wish to say that the results which I will be talking about from the dissertation that I produced in 2019 as part of my bachelor's in archeology, span um, a historiography of Maltese catacomb study from the 16th century to 1899 would not be the same without the keen supervision of my supervisor at the time, Dr. Keith Bohajar. So my extreme gratitude to him, I'm not sure if he's here today, but um, I hope that I will, um, I hope that he is. So uh, let's get started. The Maltese catacombs, we probably know what the catacombs are. However, um, if we don't, they are large labyrinthine places of burial, which are subterranean. Now, most may be familiar with the Roman catacombs before the Maltese catacombs. And uh, indeed in Rome, there are such very large labyrinthine complexes they were excavated actually earlier than the Maltese um, catacombs, as far as we know, uh, about the early second century AD. And currently in Malta, there is no evidence for the use of the catacombs um, to predate the fourth century AD in the state that we know them as places of Paleo-Christian burial. So um, we see the excavation of the Maltese catacombs, which are multi faith sites by the ancients in the fourth century AD, and the Maltese catacombs being utilized as a burial ground until the sixth century AD. 
We then see some of them being recut into oratories in the sixth and seventh century and remaining in use until the ninth century. Now for scholarly interests, the catacombs were always known to exist. They were reused as dwellings in the medieval period, converted to cave churches, or used for other activities such as cenobitic activities in the 12th century, and the case in point would be Abatia Taldeir. For a while, the catacombs were also mainly seen as looting sites rich in treasure. But then a, a shift to more scholarly investigations will occur as we will talk about throughout this uh, presentation. I just wish to quote one case, which I find quite interesting. So this shows that looting did occur around uh, the 16th century. Um, and the case in point would be this permission given to one Josephus Callus by the Grand Master of the Order of St. John, who was actually given the permission to look for buried treasure on the condition that the order would receive a third of the fines. So this is actually, you know, quite funny in comparison to what uh, we see happening today when we were trying to safeguard our heritage, but the government at the time is actually looking to give permissions and actually gain something from looting activity. So uh, now I will just explain a little bit what a historiography is, um, just in these few lines that are written on the screen. So historiography is the writing of history, especially the writing of history based on the critical examination of sources, the selection of particular details from the authentic materials in those sources, and the synthesis of those details into a narrative that stands the test of critical examination. And here I wish to emphasize the critical examination part. So what I've basically done through my research is uh, I have looked at sources pertaining to catacomb studies, starting from the vague mention, as we will discuss, by Jean Quintin in the 16th century, up until Antonio Aneto Caruana's work, um, sort of in 1899. And I analyzed these sources critically in order to gain information about socio-political context, religious context, personal leanings, and other factors that may have influenced catacomb researchers to write what they did. A few aims of uh, my uh, study, just to uh, let you know what it, was, what it is about, I firstly aim to trace the evolution, so the shift from antiquarian thinking to more scientific. The dissertation also aims to bring out shifting patterns of thinking related to, for instance, the idea that giants were present in the early years in Malta, um, recognizing catacombs as purely Christian places of repose, interpreting the catacombs as places of refuge during the persecutions, recognizing the phases of reutilizations of the catacomb, and also understanding the origins of catacomb complexes. Secondly, I also uh, aim to critically assess and evaluate these sources. I focus on noting intellectual trends and personal and external factors that may have inspired statements, um, such as a researcher who we will mention, Gianfrancesco Abela, his understanding of the catacombs as places of Christianity, intimately connected to those of Rome. So in the dissertation, I took a scholar by scholar approach to discuss catacomb study. And in the first part of my lecture, I will be taking this approach to take you through the researchers, who they are, and talk a little bit about them. And then I will shift to discuss some main themes when it comes to uh, the research that I've done uh, in catacomb study. So uh, I will start with Jean Quintin. In 1536, he published his Militae in Solaia Descriptio. Um, and he mentions uh, or describes a cave dug in a rock with two altars within. Now, there is no direct reference to the catacombs. However, um, after research, this place which he describes may be identified as St. Paul's Grotto. It does not allude to its use as a burial space. It is significant to remember that the grotto was reclaimed from a catacomb, so it is possible that he was you know, familiar with the site. And so this is where sort of the first mention of the catacomb space begins. Moving on to a more direct mention in 1610, one Marc Antonio Asha writes a first-hand account um, describing very large grottos and underground caverns with cells and various apartments of remarkable shape. He describes these places as burial places. 
So here we have the first direct mention of these, um, cat these you know, the catacombs being um, created as burial places. And we know that researchers are becoming familiar uh, with this idea. Um, what's interesting to note here is the language that he uses, large grottoes. Um, this I will talk about later um, in main theme section and also when I discuss Gianfrancesco Abela, because the language is very interesting to analyze when it came to uh, catacomb study. So Giovanni Francesco Abela. Giovanni Francesco Abela was a Maltese nobleman who is known as the first Maltese historian. In reading his work, it is really crucial to understand the social, um, political and religious milieu that possibly conditioned his thoughts and views. In 1647, he published this work, De la Descrizione di Malta. And we note in this uh, text that Giovanni Francesco Abela was very much pro-European. He saw Malta as a European island located in Italy and Sicily sphere of influence. He thus adopts a Eurocentric mentality in his uh, work. He was also devoutly Christian. He refers to Christianity, in fact, as un sacra religione. And he was also very much influenced by the Roman researcher Antonio Bolzio, who is uh, sort of the forefather of catacomb archaeology. He is the main writer when it comes, when it came to uh, texts about the catacombs at the time, who was very keen on discovering the Roman catacombs. And Gianfrancesco Abela was very familiar with his work. And so uh, one can say that he's very much echoing Bozio's um, uh, understandings in his work. And we can see this in, for instance, size estimations that he ascribes. He says that uh, he visited the Santa Venera catacombs and he describes it as un gran spazio di luogo, so gran spazio, large space. However, this was unclear at the time, probably. So it's possible that he is ascribing a hypothetical size estimation based on Rome. Um, also, when it comes to Christianity, he focuses on solely Christian sites, or at least sites which he interprets as solely Christian. He also describes paganism as una falsa religione. And we have, must remember that he was writing in the time of the Counter-Reformation. So he would have been part of the sort of Christian group uh, fighting against this uh, reformation and emphasizing Christianity. Besides this, more locally, he would have probably wanted to try whitewash elements of the Muslim past. We must remember that the Great Siege, which took place in 1565, was not so far in the memory of the Maltese. We can say it was still fresh in the minds of the Maltese people. And it is possible that the Order of St. John, the climate that they were fostering at the time in this sense, would have influenced Abela to write what he did, focusing on Christian elements. Um, over here, I've included the plan of Abbazia Tadei, which Abela includes in his Della Descrizione di Malta. I think this plan is extremely significant for the purpose of our study, and I would really like to thank my examiners um, and specifically Dr. Ruben for helping me reach this conclusion that this is possibly um, the first plan and section for uh, Maltese archaeology. We can see in the foreground we have a plan of Abbazia Tadei, which are exceptional catacombs located in Rabat. And in the background, we have a section uh, view. So this is uh, very um, exciting. So uh, moving on to the 18th century, here I will discuss Antonio, uh, Giovanni Antonio Chantar, as well as some travelers, but specifically focusing on uh, Jean Huel. So uh, Giovanni Antonio Chantar. Chantar was a historian, antiquarian, and poet who published his Malta Illustrata in 1772. This is a corrected and updated version of Abela's Della Descrizione di de Malta, which contains some useful additions on the discoveries made since. Chanta basically reproduces Abela's opinions on many matters, such as his view on the geographic location of Malta and how it lay in Sicilian waters. He also believed in Antonio Bozio's famous myth, and this was that the catacombs were utilized as hiding places during the Christian persecutions. 
uh, which we know today is not the case. In the fourth chapter of the Malta Lustrata, he rewrites Abella's observations on the catacombs, but also adds his own contributions, as well as listing some new catacomb sites. Shantar was very well versed in early Christian studies and provides Christian descriptions for the phenomena he observes. Now, apart from Chantar's Malta Lustrata, valuable knowledge regarding the state and understanding of the Maltese catacombs is gained from accounts written by foreign visitors to the island. The value placed on empirical knowledge gained through first-hand experience and observation gave travelers an important role in European scholarly development from the 16th century onwards. With the arrival of the Order of St. John in Malta and their victorious outcome in the Great Siege, Malta had gained considerable attention from European leaders and travelers who were keen on visiting the islands for several reasons. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the islands were primarily visited by noblemen of military pursuits, but by the second half of the 18th century, a shift to the narrative style travelo, which aimed to entertain the reader, took place. As I will discuss later, Malta has very close links with Sicily and Italy, and travelers visiting the island would have likely visited Sicily before coming to Malta. We thus observe travelers such as Richard Gold Hoare, an Englishman likening the use of the Maltese catacombs to those in Sicily and Salerno. The catacombs of Malta and Sicily share very similar characteristics, such as their predetermined plan and the popularity of the Baldacchino tombs in the southeastern Sicilian countryside and most Maltese hypogea. These similarities served as a reference point for travelers when remarking upon the state and appearance of the Maltese catacombs. In analyzing travelogues of the 17th and the 18th centuries, it is thereby crucial to keep the revival of Malta's medieval links with Sicily and the role that travelers played in this revival in mind. In this section, I've chosen to focus on one traveler, Jean Huel, since his travelogue entries pertaining to the Maltese catacombs are accompanied by his lithographs, and I think that they are truly exceptional. Huel was a French artist born in 1735. He was a talented painter and a traveler who wrote his voyage pictoresque, Des Iles de Sicile, de Malte et de Paris, which contained details of great engravings and textual descriptions of the sites he visited during his travels in Sicily, Malta, and Lee Paris. His volume provides a short but valuable first hand account and description of the tombs of Benjamma which were accompanied by four lithographs reproduced here. The image I'm showing here is a uh, view of Benjamma from the chapel of St. Mary of Letters. And he describes that from this chapel, he could identify sepulchral graves in the rocky walls, thus recognizing the hypogeal nature of the site. However, well at the time, had a Greek origin to the complex. Well also describes how the bodies would have been deposited and states that they were embalmed and wrapped in cloth, which would have then been secured with strips. He concludes that the presence of tombs of various sizes indicated that burials were of the inhumation type as opposed to cremations. His detailed observations of the harmonious construction of the tombs embellished with a cavity for the head and narrowed at the end to accommodate the feet indicates the analytical spirit with which he approached the site. Uh, here we have a plan drawn by Huel and underneath a plan drawn by uh, Mario Buhajar. Uh, the plans of the three hypogea produced here show that Huel took time to plan their internal structure. And the plan of the central hypogeum corresponds to Buhajar's plan of hypogeum 25 at Benjamma. Comparing the plans, well, it's etching uh, gives an idea of a more neatly proportional layout, which are drawn, you know, the, the, the tombs are drawn as perfect squares, whereas Bahaja's sketch is truer to shape. Nonetheless, the etchings prove that Huel was a skilled draftsman and provide insight into the state of the Benjamma catacombs at the time. So now we can move on into the 19th century, where we see that catacomb research is gaining more momentum and we see uh, more people being interested in studying these catacombs from this scholarly perspective. So these are the researchers on this study, and I will just give a brief mention 
on a few, um, the researchers that have listed here before I move on to the thematic section. So, honorato breast. In AIDS publishes Malta Antica Lustrata. Bress was a high-ranking clergyman, historian, and politician who also took an interest in the catacombs. In his text, he mainly refers to the information derived from the Abela and Chantar publications and makes logical conclusions about the phenomena he observed whilst remaining respectful to the Catholic Church. This being said, one does note some misgivings in, uh, was re uh, in uh, Bress's reasoning about the catacombs. He was, for example, convinced that Malta was once a Greek colony and describes the catacombs to the Greek period. He also echoes Bosio's famous myth in stating that the Greeks uh, would have excavated the catacombs and then the Christians would have reused them as hiding places. George Percy Badger, 20 years later, writes his uh, text, Description of Malta and Gozo. Badger was an Orientalist and uh, was also of the impression that Malta had a Greek period, but nonetheless, he, he ascribes uh, another explanation for the origins of the Maltese catacombs. Unlike many others, Bedger did not believe that the Christians created the catacombs as hiding places because he thought that it was too unlikely for them to have dug these complexes during times of persecution. If they were dug in peacetime, he also noted that this wouldn't make much sense either due to the fact that the catacombs are along major highways. He thus states that the catacombs were originally made by the Phoenicians or the Romans, which is not totally incorrect, as I'm sure some are familiar with the hypothesis that the catacombs are derived from Phoenician tombs and are an extension of these tombs. Um, however, despite noting that they were not created by uh, the, in the Calipatra Christian period, he still believed that they were used as Christian places of refuge once the hypogea fell into abandonment. He thus interprets the catacombs as places that the early Christians were forced to use rather than as practical solutions for inhumation burials. Reverend Moses Margaret, he visits the island in the 1800s. Um, he was an English priest who wrote several letters about his travels in France, Malta, and North Africa. In his text, A Pilgrimage to the Land of My Fathers, he writes an entry in 1847, describing a tedious day's work opening up an untouched tomb in Bin Gemma, which he believed to belong to an early race of giants who inhabited that spot. Clearly, uh, he was very influenced by popular opinion and associated the Maltese megalithic monuments and seemingly Bin Gemma with a race of giants. Now, this is quite interesting, and I'll talk about this uh, understanding of giants roaming the island a bit later. Andrew Leith Adams. Leith Adams was a naturalist, geologist, and army physician who studied the natural history of the countries that he was posted in. In his work, he states that the Maltese tombs, known as the Mala Hypogea, were not created by megalithic builders who he believed were the Phoenicians. He rightly states that it is too difficult to determine which people created the catacombs due to indications of use by different people at different times, and he is very right in saying so. He also remarks upon the Benjamin Hypogea, which he deems to have been dwellings and cattle pens in the Palo Christian period, and mentions that they were very heavily pillaged and subject to unprofessional investigation. So Charles Wright, Charles Wright was a keen researcher, well acquainted with Maltese archeology. span He was also the vice president of the Archeological Society founded in 1866, which was intent on research, documentation and preservation of archeology. span The society is a huge step for archaeology in Malta, as it shows the communal effort in protecting and researching Maltese heritage. The fact that Wright was vice president of the organization gives him some authority when it came to catacomb investigations. He surveyed the Jesuit Hill Hypogeum III, which he dates to the Roman period. And on this site, he collaborated with the librarian, musician, author, and archaeologist, Cesare Vassallo. Vassallo was another keen researcher who has a couple of publications, but the most interesting one, in my opinion, is the Guido al Museo, in which he catalogues the antiquities of the Maltese islands and provides vague descriptions of their find spot, 
as well as historical and visual information. He divides his work according to time periods. This cataloging is really significant for this time and it really shows intentions for museum display and public engagement, which is a huge uh, step forward from the antiquarian tradition. Now, uh, the last two scholars I will discuss. So firstly, Giovanni Gazzait. He was an ecclesiastic and rector of St. Paul's Grotto. Um, so he had access to the adjoining catacombs, thus allowing him to write his La Grotta di San Paolo a Malta in 1863. Gazzait classified the Maltese catacombs as secret places for Christian meetings. And thus again, we're seeing Antonio Bosio's myth being influential here. This influence would have prevented the researcher from realizing that the narrow galleries would have been unfavorable in case of invasion. However, something interesting that he mentions is the so-called Eutychia uh, painting in St. Paul's catacombs. Here we're looking at an image um, of possibly a scribe sitting on a chair and on top is an anchor, which is a symbol of hope for the afterlife in Christian tradition and above is an inscription which would read out Tikia, so it's possible um, that uh, there are several interpretations that are possible, but uh, this Giovanni Gazzai provides one of them, and uh, I would urge you to look into his work because he also collaborated with scholars abroad for uh, this particular piece of art. Now, finally, uh, Antonio Neto Caruana, I won't dwell too much on his work in this part as in. Uh, the thematic uh, section, I will talk about him more. But he was a scholar active in the 80s and 90s, and he wrote various reports concerning archaeology. He was a graduate of theology, rector of the university, and librarian and keeper of Maltese antiquities at the National Library. Here I'm showing uh, the, his publication, Ancient Pagan Tombs and Christian Cemeteries in the Islands of Malta. Explored and surveyed from the year 1881 and 1897. And he accompanies his descriptions with uh, very interesting plan and section drawings. So now I will move on to discuss five major themes that shine through when looking through catacomb related sources. Uh, these are the themes antiquarianism and archaeology, issues of identity, catacomb dating catacomb function, and Italian and Sicilian connections. So I will first start with the antiquarianism and archaeology theme. So um, in this respect, we see a shift from treasure hunting to antiquarianism, to the more scientific practice um, and methodological uh, study of archaeology. So when it comes to the shift from treasure hunting to antiquarianism, I think that this is drastically marked by the entrance of works by Jean Quintin and Abela. In these authors' texts, we know the difference in motives and interests in comparison to those of uh, the aforementioned treasure hunter, Josephus Callus. Now with Abela, we see antiquarianism at its finest, since he was a collector of antiques and researcher in his own right. Indeed, Abela had a private collection, which he curated and kept in his home, sometimes to be exhibited to small groups. The thing with antiquarian collections, however, is that they are not like modern museums. They were only available to a few who had the chance to see the objects. However, with Abela, we see a departure from this mentality, since he actually passed on his collection to the Jesuit College, thus showing his desire for future scholars to have access to his finds. This is one step in the departure from antiquarianism to the more professional practice of archaeology. Another step leads me to uh, re-mention the setting up of the Maltese Archaeological Society in 1866. This is a really remarkable development for Malta, mimicking what was being set up in the UK, as it showed scholarly collaboration for the sake of safeguarding and researching Maltese archaeology. More ship are exhibited um, through Vassallo's Guida del Museo, al Museo, which shows the growing importance of cataloging archaeological finds. Yet the major shift, major shift for the time span concerned in this dissertation really comes with Caruana. This uh, is a plan of the Tal Libro Hypogeum. 
with Caruana, we see a shift to more consciousness, more refined scientific thinking. Firstly, Caruana's plans, sections, and drawings show concern with recording and preserving the memory of aspects of Maltese heritage, including the catacombs, since he was researching at a time where construction and archaeology were already at conflict. His plans are so detailed and so professional that it is actually quite remarkable. Uh, here we have a section view of the same catacombs. Uh, Caruana was also an advocate for presenting finds accompanied by detailed information, which he would present to the public, rather than keeping them hidden in private collections. Apart from this, he also had a keen eye for detail and actually writes in 1898 that he noted now marks of percussion, which must have indicated that the catacombs, here he's talking about the Mala Hypogea, were excavated with sharp pointed metal tools. Now, this is really interesting and something that other researchers never really looked out for, save for late Adams, who also noted percussion marks in these specific chambers. Um, and the final note showcasing Caruana's scientific thinking is his cross-disciplinary approach to archaeology by using geology. Indeed, he distinguished between catacombs excavated in Upper Coraline Limestone and Globigerina, which is an important feature in differentiating between rural and urban catacombs. So another theme, a choose of identity. So today we know that the catacombs are multi-faith sites used by pagans, Jews, and Christians simultaneously. Yet in the past, there seems to be a trend of hyper-emphasis on the catacombs being purely Christian places of, of burial. Indeed, most scholars did not recognize that there were elements of other religious faiths in the catacombs, but seemed to whitewash these elements by talking about solely Christian catacombs and elements. For example, Abela mentions seven catacombs in his Della Descrizione di Malta, and he gives Christian interpretations for all these catacombs. I find it a bit hard to believe that he did not come across any signs of paganism that he would have recognized as pagan. And um, maybe he did this purposely. He did recognize what they were, but chose not to mention them. The same can be said for Chantar, who reproduces his work. This can also be interpreted as a result of uh, anti-pagan sentiment and the influence of Antonio Bosio. We've already mentioned how influential he was and how due to him writing due to during the Counter-Reformation, uh, there are highly Christian tones and motives in his work. This surely affected researchers such as Abela and Chantar's point of view. Otherwise, we can't forget about the political religious climate created by the Order of St. John in Malta. Where, which was at the time concerned with whitewashing elements of the Islamic past and reaffirming Catholic European identity. So um, these are basically what we've spoken about. Here I'm putting an excerpt of the, from the Malta Government Gazette from 1838. Here the author writes that it is very difficult to precisely determine by what nation these excavations were formed. And indeed, it is a point upon which antiquarians are at variance. But that they were made of by the Christians for many years is incontestable. And they are actually very right in uh, this statement. And they are basing this uh, on the presence of decoration that is distinctively Christian, that has Christian meaning behind it. And so these symbols, they say, may be taken as efficient grounds for believing that the place was no other than a Christian cemetery. So we're seeing here um, evidence being used to reach uh, in certain interpretations, and there's a backing for, for this interpretation too. So um, a note about Maltese researchers and foreign researchers. So even Caruana in the 19, 1890s remained convinced of the Christian identity of the catacombs, despite noticing that they were preceded by pagan family tombs. This contrasts with the description of travelers who focus on the mysteriousness of the catacombs. And then we have Badger and Late Adams who actually do suggest uh, pagan use. Despite suggesting this use, however, there is no reference to the simultaneous use of the catacombs and, and Christians. There was always the impression amongst these scholars that there were first, they were first used by pagans and then by Christians. 
The only scholar to suggest simultaneous use of the catacombs and members of another faith, which is the Jewish faith, was actually uh, Giovanni Gatzeit, who mentions that they were used by Jews and Christians at the same time when analyzing the um, uh, architecture that he saw in the St. Paul's Grotto catacombs or the Winyaport catacombs. So uh, catacomb dating. We today know that the catacombs were excavated by the Romans in Malta no earlier than the fourth century AD. However, this was not always the understanding. Until the mid 19th century, antiquarians subscribed to the Bishop Usher chronology, which stated that the world was created by God in 4004 BC. These hypotheses were generally stuck to and predominated until Jacques Boucher de Pertz in uh, 1841 found evidence for the association of humans with extinct animal bones, which, is, which essentially invalidated the notion of the biblical flood and hinted towards the idea of prehistory. The term prehistory then came into use with the publication of uh, Lubbock's Prehistoric Times in 1865. Yet in Malta, the concept of prehistory only really entered towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So before it was known or even hypothesized that prehistoric man roamed the island, it was generally believed that the builders of Malta's megalithic monuments, such as Tarshin, um, the Tarshin temples, I mean, are and thus the first settlers in Malta were the Phoenicians. So, however, some dare to pose uh, another hypothesis that there was an earlier race rather than the Phoenicians there were uh, giants who are responsible for the, catac um, the catacombs of Benjamin, Bishop Margoliath's um, uh, interpretation, but also the megalithic temples, according to Abela. And so uh, they state that um, there was once a race of giants and basically with Antonio Neta Caruana, a, a departure from this hypothesis really begins and the concept of prehistory starts um, circulating around, you know, the, the circle of Maltese scholars. So, um, the part from antiquarianism, yes, occurs with Caruana. He noticed that the catacombs were excavated by cultured peoples and bases his understanding on several factors, two of which being the absence of lithic tools and remains of extinct animal bones. Now, the concept of the prehistoric period for Mota was not yet fully adopted by local researchers, but Caruana does show awareness of this idea. Uh, he nonetheless asserts that the Phoenicians were the first inhabitants of the island. He also uh, correctly ascribes the catacombs to the Roman period. This being said, he, like many other catacomb researchers under review, were off by a few centuries since Abela, Caruana and the like were convinced that the catacombs were excavated at the same time that the Roman catacombs were in the first century AD. The reason for the attribution of such an early date is mainly threefold. Rome was a key reference. There was the idea of persecutions and uh, St. Paul's biblical shipwreck entry with the belief that there was a mass conversion to Christianity um, after his shipwreck in Malta. Aside from this early date, there were much earlier attributions for the catacombs. Brest, as we have mentioned, dates them to the Greek period, as he presumed that at some point Malta was a Greek colony. Bajan and Late Adams uh, say that they were dated to the Phoenician period, but reused later. But can you really criticize inaccuracies? Rome was the main reference at the time. There was so much pillaging. Excavation was done without recording the context. There was no carbon 14 dating at the time. Even today, it is a difficult task. So uh, a word about catacomb function. Throughout the period under review, several functions were assigned to the catacombs. Indeed, today we know that the catacombs were funerary and ritual places used by the early Christians and members of pagan and Jewish faiths in the late Roman period. Yet in the past, they were erroneously also interpreted as places of refuge for the early Christians during the years of persecution. This belief, stemming from Antonio Bosio's famous myth, provided the erroneous chronological yardstick for catacomb dating, as mentioned before, and conditioned the understanding of many authors, including Abela, Chantar, 
um, gut side and so on. The only person during these years who really did notice that the catacombs could not have been used as places of hiding was Badger, who states that uh, their location was so exposed and on such major highways that they would have made ill-suited hiding places. Um, other than interpreting the catacombs as hiding places, some visitors to the island uh, also interpreted Malta's catacombs as dwellings, grain, corn, and olive production units. Now, these travelers were not familiar with the funerary and ritual uses of the catacombs, so uh, it is unsurprising uh, that these functions would be assigned. Plus, the catacombs went through many stages of reuse, making it more difficult to interpret your original function. For instance, Vassallo interprets the Benjamin hypogea as dwellings, which is in a way correct, as they did serve a domestic function in the medieval period. However, he didn't know their previous phase of use, which was funerary. So um, our final slide before we conclude, I will discuss uh, Italy-Sicily connections. Malta had close ties with Italy and Sicily since prehistory. After all, it is hypothesized that the first human settlers on the island came from Sicily. Millennia later, in 218 BC, Malta was incorporated into the Roman Empire as part of the islands of Sicily. And it seems that between the 5th to the 15th century, Malta's administration was closely linked to and overseen by Sicily. Um, according to Dalli, in the medieval period, Malta was used as a satellite, thus fulfilling the military function of repelling Muslim expansion, a stepping stone between Europe and Africa, and a sentinel, import, important for the defense of the island of Sicily. During the years of the Order of St. John, one notes a very strong relationship with Italy, creating a socio-political climate that was highly Italianate, but moreover Latin, and European. Indeed, Abel and Chantar make it a point to describe Malta's geographic location in light of its proximity to Sicily and Italy. And indeed, they stress how close Malta is to Sicily and emphasize this link. Ignoring the fact that Malta is also geographically near South Africa. The fact that these connections were ignored really reflects the climate fostered by the order, which was concerned with Latinization and whitewashing elements of the Islamic past. Aside from the stress on Malta's location with respect to Italy, connections with Italy, and particularly Rome, are reflected in the descriptions given to the Maltese catacombs. Indeed, we have already mentioned that Abela, Chantar, and some travelers described the catacombs as large, labyrinthine spaces. Considering the fact that the, the catacombs were probably largely unclear at the time of writing, it can be said that these descriptions were given on the basis of authors' familiarity with uh, Antonio Bosio's Roma Sotterranea. In the case of travelers, their familiarity with the catacombs overseas would have influenced their description. These descriptions also reflect the availability of resources at the time, since Rome was the main source of information. Um, a final note, in the 19th century, uh, things change, and we see a sort of evolution marked by a break with Italy. Save for a few author's descriptions, there is much less of an emphasis on Italy-Sicily connections. And Caruana finally addresses the erroneous size estimations and provides more accurate dimensions and plans. Now, this all has to do once again with the socio-political climate of the time. Uh, we all know that by the 19th century, Malta was under the British and the British didn't have much interest in associating Malta with Sicily at the, mom at the moment. In fact, the, in, their interests were clearly manifested in the language question, which took place in the 1880s, were basically pro-Italian, it were in favor of a Latin European identity for Malta, and the British saw Malta as more of a central Mediterranean outpost for the British Empire. So, in the 19th century, with the British encouraging less emphasis on Italy, we see comparisons with these starting to come in. And this would ultimately reach a climax in the 20th century with Eric Becker's Malta Soterrania, which he devotes many pages to Eastern connections. And uh, this is where I stop. And thank you for listening as we would be going into another century, which was uh, not within the scope of my research. However, um, it's a very interesting uh, 
time periods to study nonetheless, um, and more developments can be seen during the century. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming today virtually. Um, I'd like to thank the ASM for hosting me, and I hope that I have kept you engaged for some time. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was uh, that was really great. Um, yes. Anybody who knows us a bit knows that. Uh, the catacombs are uh, the favorite subject of, of Ange and Jen, Little John and myself. And uh, we have here also David Cardona, who is, uh, uh, looks after all the St. Uh, Paul's catacombs. So lots of interest in what you've been saying, definitely. Um, uh, I'm uh, just looking on the, on the chat now to see if we have any, any, uh, any questions, particular questions. I'm not seeing anybody. I've, I've got uh, a few that uh, I'd like to, to ask you, or rather comments. This, um, the, the issue of, of, uh, of that religious um, bias that uh, people tended to, tended to have, even, even uh, Paolo Francesco Bellanti, um, mm -hmm. It, obviously beyond what you're what you've stopped at 1899 which is fair enough but even somebody who came in the very early part of the 20th century um, still still was a, a very a good archaeologist and and very interesting did not a lot of good work on the catacombs but he definitely had that um, religious bias which uh, impeded his sort of judgment a little bit about uh, the, the history actually of the um, of the catacombs and uh, so I was just a, just a comment and see what you have to say about uh, about that um, yes it's very true I mean um, this influence does not just stop sort of with Caruana when we see more scientific thinking taking place you know, people are influenced by different things. They can be personal factors. They can be related to faith. They can be related to sort of they're working for someone who they're working for. And uh, these really come out in their studies, their interpretations. Um, so this does very much make sense. And I think it is quite important to um, have modern readers keep this in mind so that comparing between sources won't seem so strange. Like, ah, oh, why are only Christian descriptions given here? Where in Becker, I'm also given descriptions uh, pertaining to connections with South Africa, uh, North Africa. So um, it's, it's really important to keep in mind. Absolutely. Um, some, some questions coming up, very, some very nice comments about, the, about your talk. Um, oh, thank uh, you. A lot of appreciation and uh, Anne is asking what uh, what sparked your interest in the, in the catacombs in the in fact in the beginning before you started off. So uh, I love the subterranean world. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I love architecture, and uh, so subterranean architecture makes me think of the catacombs. And since the first time I visited them, I just you know I couldn't get enough, and now I really want to go to Rome and see those catacombs because they, those still await my visit. Um, so basically, it was just a fascination with the catacombs. And then my supervisor proposed, like, ah, oh, there is a gap over here. Although some research has been done with regards to historiography by, for instance, Mario Bohajar um, and uh, Chiara Cecalupo as well. Um, she um, she talks about uh, Giovanni Francesco Abela. Um, sort of, there's a bit of a gap, and it's really important nowadays that a historiographical take place. So I saw it quite interesting. I love looking through texts. I did have a knowledge of Italian. I mean, I do have a knowledge of Italian, so it was feasible. And so uh, this is the result. Yeah, the opportunity. Very good. Yes. Um, uh, there's a question here, uh, if I find it again. Yes, on, on what basis did Abel and then Chantar call the catacombs Christian? What, what were the symbols? Do you remember what the symbols were that they, men that they mentioned in their, in their writings that tended to convince them about the Christianity of the origin? Um, right now, the specifics are escaping me. Don't but worry. for example, we must 
also remember that Abela did not visit the catacombs like we visited them today. So there is a lot of sort of speculation when it comes to this. So he's entering a place, looks like a catacomb. I can see that there's more back there. And this is why we see, you know, size estimations being ascribed erroneously. And since Antonio Bozio was so keen um, to ascribe, you know, Christian interpretations, this is where his Christian interpretations come in. Um, but, you know, there are various symbols, for example, that uh, painting which I showed in St. Paul's catacombs, the Otikia one, you know, the uh, anchor, which is the symbol of hope and religious tradition. Um, so things like this, basically. Mm. There's always the, the difficulty always is that the Christianity uh, took over many of the pagan symbols um, for their own. Yes, yes, of course. There's a double interpretation there. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a problem. Uh, somebody's asking, you mentioned someone who was given permission to search the catacombs. Can you repeat the name, please? Yes, Josephus Kalus. Yes, she got it right. In fact, she says, I thought it was Josephus Kalus, but I wasn't sure. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Um, just looking up to see, uh, asking an obvious, uh, an, an obvious question. You've been around the catacombs quite a lot, I imagine. Um, yes, many times. <laughs> I, I know I have favorite ones. Do, do you have favorite ones as well? I don't think anything can really be St. Paul's catacombs, just because, and specifically Holby or Abbazia Tadeir. I mean, they're all so special, but I think St. Paul's catacombs were the first ones I visited, and that's where, you know, I felt that connection. So yeah. I, I have to say that it's, it's them, although Abbazia Tadeir is a close second because those are truly magnificent. They really are, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, somebody's saying here that they their favorite is Halres Ung. And I think of that is, uh, is, is a real special specialty. The specialty. art there is amazing. It's rediscovered so recently. So yes. we haven't actually actually seen it very much. Uh, now going to be caught underneath the Gudia uh, overpass. Um, but anyway, that's another discussion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, I think that, that Ruben Grima, uh -huh. thank you, Rebecca, I thought to keep in mind when reading Abela and his contemporaries is that um, Galileo's trial in 1633 was fresh in the memory. Um, uh, so maybe there was censorship, sorry, I'm not, I'm not um, reading that very well. But yes, I, I suppose there are historical things that were going on at that time in the 17th century yeah. uh, that could have influenced people's um, desire to a little bit to may have biased their approach. Let's put it that way. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and uh, he's continuing. What the censor made of the text uh, was a crucial consideration, and it's an important point that um, Dr. Grima is making here. That uh, even even censorship um, would have been uh, an influence on yes. what people said. And, and, and did. Uh, Definitely. Okay. Um, I, I one comment I wanted to make was that um, you showed us some of A. A. Caruana's uh, uh, pa paintings. Really, one has to call them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I always thought, looking at them, they're really artworks, aren't they? They are indeed. Really? They are. They're not just diagrams or, you know. No, and I think people who are interested in art, architecture, archaeology will tend to gain from looking, you know, flipping a bit through his uh, publication because it's, it's truly wow, especially for the time period. It's, it's incredible. Yes, it certainly is. Um, Somebody is asking because they didn't catch it. What is the earliest dating for catacombs, please? As uh, they, didn't, they didn't catch that. In Malta, the, there's no evidence for them to predate the 4th century uh, AD. However, in Rome, it's more like uh, early 2nd century. Mm. Um, uh, somebody's mentioning um, um, Quintinus mentions, uh, uh, and, I, and I quote, a, a cavern with two altars. Could mm -hmm. that be the main chapel, in inverted commas, at St. Paul's catacombs? Um, I'm sort of more convinced on St. Paul's Grotto, but definitely possible. Mm -hmm. Could be, because you possible. never know what, 
what what it looked like exactly when yeah yeah looking at it <laughs> for sure really yes yes and uh, also the 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 pictorial elements as well of the mm. catacombs which unfortunately you know has been lost to us now yes so uh, that that is an aspect of them that could also give indications of um, what what uh, what religion they were associated with Definitely. at the time, but so uh, we've lost we've lost that possibility really mm -hmm. of seeing them. Well, if any if there aren't any more questions, um, I'd uh, like to say thank you to uh, everyone for participating in this evening's event. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again for the next uh, talk, which will be by Nico Muscat, who will present the contribution of Francis S. Malia, uh, 1921 to 1988, to Maltese archaeology and archaeological practice. And that will be on the 19th of May at the usual time of uh, 6 p.m. Malta time. Uh, I encourage anybody who's interested in the society to access our website at www.archsoc.org.mt and uh, uh, do contemplate joining the society because uh, we really need help to, um, to do the things that we do, uh, both from the point of uh, ex or nor normal expenses like website, etc., but also the kind of advocacy that we do uh, in, um, in support of uh, Malta's archaeology uh, and, 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 and in Gozo as well, of course. So um, that if you join the society, you'll really be, really be helping us. Um, sincerest, sincerest thanks from the ASM and the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University of Malta to Rebecca Sherry uh, this evening for um, what was a very, very interesting talk. Um, plenty of things that, you know, one could go on discussing about the catacombs, but that's, uh, that's something I could do all night, really. Um, thank you so much for that. And we look forward to seeing everybody uh, again at our next event. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for being with us this evening.